Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Charles Denham, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar for uh, October. We're really privileged to have uh, some great uh, uh, speakers today and reactors today. And Kyle, could you give me the authorization to move five? There you go. Uh, so welcome to everyone for our October, our, our October uh, High Performer webinar. We are really privileged to have some great uh, uh, speakers and leaders from the national community. Uh, and my job is just to address some of the housekeeping details as usual. Just make sure for first time viewers, if you can put your volume up to the maximum on your computer so that you can make sure to have uh, the best audio. And I'm on slide four. If you have difficulties, if you uh, need to, you can go to the participant window and there's a small phone icon and you can click on that to request a separate phone line that will give you uh, uh, better audio if you need it. For those that have the slides, I'm on slide five. And this is the landing page of uh, safetyleaders.org. And in the upper right quadrant of this landing page, you can click on that uh, to go back to have more of the resources that we'll cover today. We're going to cover a lot of really good resources uh, available for EHR uh, safety and health information technology safety. So that will be up, and you'll be able to go, go to that. And then for uh, those of you that don't have the slides, in the upper right-hand quadrant, you go to uh, the section that says what's new. New, and that will allow you to go to the page where you'll see a picture of John Nance. And as you uh, glide down on that page, as you scroll down, you'll be able to identify where to get the slides and additional resources that we'll have for you. Slide 7 is, you know, is the social media page. Just uh, uh, our address is there. And then slide 8. We always want to start off by just refocusing ourselves on the purpose for TMIT, our purpose statement and mission. And our purpose is that we will measure our success by how we protect and enrich the lives of families, patients, and caregivers. And this area of health information technology and the special area of healthcare accident investigation is really important to both. Our mission is to accelerate performance solutions that save lives save money, create value in the communities that we serve. And on slide nine, we have our disclosure statement, which I won't read for you. And we're not talking about any products uh, uh, that any of the speakers are, uh, are engaged with uh, at all today. We're talking about healthcare accident investigations and our community of practice for health information technologies. Our speakers and reactors today, John Nance, uh, best-selling uh, author uh, nationally and just a wonderful speaker who's going to address the second part of his two-part series for us. And Christopher Peabody is an emergency medicine uh, physician, uh, recently trained a uh, leader uh, who will be an educator at UCSF and leading our HIT community of practice. Jennifer Dingman, our longstanding has joined the meeting. And uh, Frank Guiato, uh, who will also be a reactor, uh, a biomedical engineer, and long term, uh, long time uh, partner with us on many of our activities. So, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Jennifer Dingman and have Jennifer uh, set the stage for us and keep us focused on patients and families. Uh, Jennifer, thank you. And I'm so much for having me today. I just would like to welcome everyone to this webinar. I'm very excited about the content of today's webinar. And I just want you to know on behalf of patients and families all over the country what you're doing by being at this webinar and trying to keep your patients safer means the world to us. I'm very excited to hear John Nance today and everyone else who is here. And thank you again, Dr. Denham, for having me on this webinar. I'll turn it back to you, sir. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. And Jennifer is a published author in patient safety, along with the patient advocacy team that uh, we work with on a continuous basis, and was also one of the co-authors of uh, the chapter on patient engagement in the NQF Safe Practices. And as such, he's also served on a number of uh, uh, agency teams uh, with the federal government. And as we start to talk about ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT and the great resources they provide, you can see that they really are focused on uh, having patients and families involved as well. So I'm going to just uh, lay a little bit of uh, uh, groundwork here for us on some recent things that were in the news and our polling highlights uh, that uh, you provided to us through our polls last time. 
First off, I just want to remind you that a number of the uh, terrific speakers that we have over the years, including uh, uh, Professor Seltner from Switzerland, former health minister of Switzerland, uh, Clay Christensen, the leader of uh, disruptive innovation and Harvard professor who has had enormous impact on our industry globally, uh, Steve Swenson, uh, the current leader of leadership development at the Mayo Clinic globally and former professor of radiology and the head of quality at Mayo Clinic, Nancy Conrad, wife of Pete Conrad, uh, the astronaut who passed away of a preventable system failure, uh, Mike Henderson, who uh, was the former chief quality officer at the Cleveland Clinic and now at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and Mary Foley, the former president of the American uh, Nursing Association and a longtime advocate uh, uh, for patient safety are all speakers at this meeting in Fort Worth, which is leading innovation in patient safety the 6th and 7th, and not competitive with anything out there because it's focused on innovation and innovators. So we just want to remind you uh, that that is upcoming in the first part uh, of the month, uh, 6th and 7th in November, and uh, re recommend that uh, uh, you take a look at it. So now talking about the news and what's really, really important was uh, last month after our webinar, uh, the IOM report, and now more formally called the National Academy of Medicine as part of the National Academies of Sciences, released its Improving Diagnosis and Healthcare Report and this terrific graphic, which I'll show again after John speaks, uh, that they used as an organizing structural framework. We really recommend that you take a look at this. We think diagnostic error is going to be one of the next really big areas that we'll all be focusing on. And so we want to remind that, remind you of that. Uh, the second thing is now talking about our polling that we've uh, uh, addressed in the last series of webinars. We focused uh, on the uh, the ECRI top ten safety concerns and the top ten technology hazards, and we've been working our way through them. And want to remind those first-time viewers that four of the technology hazards are in the top ten of all of the. Uh, patient safety concerns, those being alarms, data integrity, EHRs, and IT, HIT, mix-up of IV lines, and inadequate reprocessing of endoscopes and surgical uh, solutions. But there are a number of others that really have a, a lot of overlap with health information technology, and we'd add cybersecurity and the dose creep with, radi uh, with uh, uh, radiology and, ra and uh, radiation uh, exposures to patients and especially children. On slide 17, we wanted to remind you that there's an ongoing uh, issue of information blocking uh, to patients, and we have a big audience of patient uh, advocates who are very anxious about access to medical records and this report to uh, the Office of the National Coordinator, and then also uh, the focus of uh, the lax oversight for health IT, and uh, well, our last slide will address uh, the ONC complaint uh, submission uh, uh, web survey. We really, we really love the fact that Onc is asking for all of us to respond on areas that they could focus uh, on, and um, you'll see uh, the polling why that's so important. So our question last month, and again, I'll go through this quickly, and then move to John and come back to our community of practice, was: I believe we need to pursue having EHR vendors be required to list products that represent at least some risk. And this was this last slide regarding a modern healthcare article that said that uh, it appeared that the committee report had changed where it had recommended that the risk lists be provided to us so we could report uh, hazard and identify accidents and tie them to hazards, uh, that the recommendation had been changed to uh, if, unless it was, uh, if it was uh, burden, burdensome only uh, to do so uh, uh, if it was not burdensome versus being made to be non-burdensome. And so uh, we pulled you, and 69% uh, of you gave it a 10 that you believe that the EHR vendors need to provide a list of products and hazard areas that represent at least some risk. And you can see the breakdown. The net promoter score is enormous. There were no neutrals or detractors. So the, uh, the overall net promoter score was, uh, was uh, uh, enormous. Uh, with 82% believing in a, uh, that uh, that that we should uh, uh, undertake this uh, uh, with a, uh, intense focus. The second question was, I would like a deeper dive 
on medical record contamination through cybercrime, which John brought up in the first part of his two-part series. So I would like a deeper dive on medical record contamination through cybercrime so we can prevent patient safety risk. And uh, this number was enormous uh, as well, uh, that you wanted a deeper dive on that, which we'll address in the community of practice. So these were, these were pretty, uh, pretty enormous uh, uh, numbers and support on these topical areas. Um, Finally, these are a number of the press articles for those that, ha that didn't attend in September uh, regarding the CHR issue, which is really impo so important for, long -standing, uh, uh, for our longstanding work. So now as I introduce John Nance uh, to you, uh, I wanted to remind you that uh, a terrific report had been released in November of 2011. So that's, you know, five, that's five uh, you, you know, four to five years ago uh, that this report, four years ago, uh, uh, that was released. Uh, and this was, uh, the committee members were terrific leaders in patient safety and quality and health information technology. And they made a number of recommendations, which I won't go through. However, they addressed why we need to address this health information technology issue using a socio-technical model or system. And you'll see this five-part system has been, a, a, that there has been further work. Uh, and uh, Dr. Hardy uh, Singh from, uh, from Houston uh, has uh, put forth a really nice model that's now being used uh, uh, for focus on patient safety. And you'll see both of these models. But this model was, was, uh, was uh, proposed to really look at health information technology. And one of the recommendations of this Health Information Technology Patient Safety Report by IOM was that the Secretary of HHS should recommend that Congress establish an independent federal entity for investigating patient safety deaths, serious injuries, and or potentially unsafe conditions associated with HIT. Now the reason, and, and this entity should also monitor and analyze data and publicly report the, res the results of these activities. This is an NTSB-like uh, agency. So we were asked to write an article that would help support the argument for the NTSB. And at that time, as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Patient Safety, uh, talked to the publishers and said, may we write such an article and accelerate it for publication so it could help support this report. And as you can see, it did. And the co-authors were Sully Sullenberger, Dennis Quaid, and John Nance. And what we all have in common is aviation. I was the owner, actually, of an airplane manufacturing company. And all of us are jet pilots. John and uh, Sully have enormous number of hours and commercial uh, ratings. Dennis Quaid and I were both uh, jet pilots, but private. But we all had different perspectives and complementary supportive perspectives on an NTSB for healthcare. The reason that I set that up for John is that uh, although this entity has not been developed, we debated it at the uh, American Society of Anesthesi Anesthesiology uh, Global Summit. John and I have presented on this topic, and in that article, which you, you'll see that John will cover, is his proposal of this wonderful concept of a red cover report. But what we've asked John to do, because many of you, because of the, the fall schedule, uh, uh, may not have been able to make the webinar last, uh, last month, and we have 80,000, the invitations go to 80,000, and we know that many are traveling or have commitments, that I'd, we asked John if he would take five minutes and recap his part one before he goes to part two, which is the red cover report. <coughs> And that's regarding healthcare cybercrime, medical professional identity theft, and vandalism. And uh, John is so well known to all of us, but for those that don't know John, John is a wonderful leader with uh, some of the most unique background capabilities and competencies that we could ever have or hope to have in patient safety. John is currently the safety uh, leader and advisor for uh, ABC um, and comments when aviation crashes occur, and he's going to share the analog to the red cover report, which originated his concept, uh, which is the blue cover report on two accidents, and he'll share that with us uh, shortly. But he also is a best-selling author of both uh, fiction and nonfiction. Uh, he has been 
been a, um, a captain with one of the major airlines. He is a, a lawyer with a great command of the legal knowledge that is so important to us, and now is really becoming a great expert in this er area of uh, healthcare information technology. So, uh, John, uh, if we, we would take 30 minutes to describe his enormous uh, uh, contribution to patient safety and aviation and uh, uh, fictional literature, but we recommend you read his bio. And John, would you take it away from here and give us a, a briefing on part one from last month and then take us into the red cover report and the concept and the what if we had a red cover report for certain act, uh, healthcare accidents that have been publicized. Absolutely, and uh, Dr. Denham, I appreciate that <laughs> gracious introduction. Uh, I, uh, I first of all, uh, as, uh, as Chuck mentioned, want to take you uh, kind of through what we talked about before uh, in the last webinar, and just in brief. Uh, basically, what we were doing is making a case for the fact that medical records, medical information of all sorts is a virgin area in terms of the defense systems that are needed to protect it against the sort of thing that has already uh, garnered a lot of defensiveness and defense systems for credit card security and for general security. They, there are three classifications uh, for general security of cyber information, and that's anything on a computer, anything on a server. Uh, it, identity breach, that's when somebody has managed to get into the server, get into the accounts and, uh, and at least look at or have access to information that they should not have access to. Identity theft occurs when people take copies of that and remove it from or copy it off of the server. And identity counterfeiting is when they start doing something with it, uh, especially in the financial realm that involves getting credit card information, selling that on the market, uh, which doesn't go for very much. But that's where one of the conundrums comes in. I'll cover in just a second. Secondly, we got into medical identity cybercrime and the fact that uh, if you have a complete set of records and all the information needed to log on and pretend to be you, uh, it brings uh, at least one order of magnitude more money for criminals who uh, manage to get this information. Again, we have an ID breach, getting into the information that they should not see, a theft of when they uh, uh, re remove it in one form or another counterfeiting when they start manipulating it, and then the damage and contamination and vandalism, this really gets very serious. And we've got to talk about, to a greater extent than anybody has before, prevention, response, and protection. Medical record blocking is also there, and, and I do consider it a crime. Uh, as a matter of fact, I want to see a federal law established as soon as we can that basically says that any information about you is your property and no one, repeat, no one can deny access to that property and that means your medical record included. Healthcare professional identity crime, this is an area that we really had not talked about before. Uh, professional ID theft, counterfeiting, publication, fraud, and misconduct, this has to do with the fact that we don't have a simple repository or a factory, if you will, that provides uh, best practices in the United States or, for that matter, anywhere in the world. We've got journals, and, and when we invest our degree of respect for and, uh, uh, shall we say, we put our faith in the articles that come out in the many journals that have now proliferated, we need to know that those are honest. And too many articles have been put out there that had to be withdrawn because they were not honest. This is a major problem, not only the lack of a best practices factory, so to speak, uh, but also the fact that what we do depend on has now become questionable with all the uh, all the different fraud elements that we've seen out there. Publication fraud, misconduct, contamination, damage, and vandalism, which also occurs when somebody uh, does something that seemingly is as simple as, uh, as you get on your Wikipedia page and, uh, and mess around with the facts and the details. This really is criminal activity, and yet uh, we don't have any way of, uh, of addressing it yet. So prevention and response to professional ID and damage and vandalism is something that we're going to have to address as a nation. Uh, then we went into uh, just a teaser, if you will, on the Red Cover Report, which I really want to talk to you about today, uh, talking about uh, two or three different cases. Let me go back over this real quickly. Identity cybercrime or computer crime, it's anything that involves a computer and a network. And when we then got into medical identity crime, cybercrime, this is an area, as I say, that most people have not dealt with most people have not considered. Uh, if we have no other article for you to take a look at, I would recommend you read this one. It's out of the Wall Street Journal, How Identity Theft Sticks You with Hospital Bills. One of the most startling aspects of that is the fact that once your data has become contaminated by somebody who illicitly got a hold of it and fooled around with it or got medical care under your name when you didn't know anything about it, 
there are hospitals who are absolutely wrongly denying access to your medical record because now it's got somebody else's information in there and uh, they say that HIPAA refuses that. I guarantee you HIPAA never said anything of the sort. And that's something that we really uh, again have to address. But this is a very good article, How Identity Theft Sticks You with Hospital Bills, Wall Street Journal. Um, and healthcare professional identity cybercrime, we mentioned, as I say, that, that really is deserving of much more than a couple of additional uh, uh, webinars. And uh, you'll be seeing more about that in the future. But this has to do with who do we trust, what word do we trust, what articles do we trust, and getting it to the point where we really don't have any doubt that what we see coming out about best practices is, uh, is accurate information. And there are a lot of different examples of things that have gone very wrong in this arena. So let me, uh, by the way, here's one other article that I should show you. The misconduct accounts for the majority of retracted scientific publications. This one will blow your socks off. National Academy of Sciences, uh, again, if there's only one thing you read, this is the one to read. A uh, detailed review of 2,047 biomedical and life science research articles uh, as uh, retracted. 21.3% uh, of those retractions were attributable to error. 67.4% were dishonesty of one sort or another, misconduct, uh, including fraud or suspected fraud. And we may need to put some criminal penalties into this, too, because we've got too many people whose lives depend on the decisions made by providers that are indirectly or directly uh, related to the things that they read in journals and in, uh, in publications. This, this really cannot be allowed to go any further. Uh, more than 2,000 retractions, as I say, 67.4% fraud is up 10 times, 10 times since 1975 in this arena. And this is another one, but by the way, as a particular case study, uh, an article that uh, came out in the New Yorker by Jill Laporte that failed to identify a conflict of interest and, uh, and really attacked with both P. Clay Christensen and then his response. And it's, uh, it pretty much speaks for itself to, to contrast and especially uh, Clay's response. Uh, let's talk now about the Red Cover Report. This is near and dear to my heart, not because <clears throat> I thought it up, but because I was witness to an evolution of the National Transportation Safety Board. And, and let me explain that as, as we go into this. First of all, the National Transportation Safety Board in themselves were not even thoroughly aware of the new philosophy that they had created. Uh, the philosophy is one that has basically as its central tenant that there is never just one cause to an accident or a major incident. And secondly, that blame is of absolutely no use whatsoever in trying to determine what to do in the future to prevent recurrences. This flies in the face, quite frankly, of the way we've always done it, which is, you know, many of you have heard me say in person, that's the most dangerous phrase in medicine, quote, this is the way we've always done it, end quote. And I think we've got pretty much everybody in agreement on that. Red cover reports are basically a derivation in my head of what a blue cover report is. And blue covers are simply the report issued to the public by the National Transportation Safety Board of any major accident or incident, especially one for which they send the go team out, as they call it, from Washington. Major airline accidents, major train accidents, shipping accidents, pipeline, I mean, it's anything in regard to transportation. But what you see when you open that blue cover is very important. You don't see this is the conclusion, this is the bad actor. You see an analysis that is incredibly structured and disciplined. First of all, a capsule recitation of what happened, just the facts, ma'am. Then a detailed recitation of everything that they discovered in the investigation with absolutely no attribution of any blame. And then a, uh, a basic taking that apart in terms of causation. In other words, looking at every single contributing cause, and very often it's 25 or 35 even 40 different contributing causes. I call those links in the causal chain. And that's significant because the chain would not lead from point A to point Z without every one of those links holding. And that means that every link was a contributor. If you broke any of those links, that particular accident would not have occurred. But here's the point. Not only do you think the safety board was really aware of this until the late 80s, if you don't address each and every link or causal factor that you find in an accident or incident investigation, you end up sh with that showing up again in another dissimilar uh, situation later on. So in other words, if you've got 26 links in the causal chain, you've got 26 different ways to contribute to another accident. Every one of them has to be addressed, and that's not what we were used to doing. So the blue cover lays all this out. It lays out the causal chain, 
and then it makes recommendations so that we don't let it happen again. Nowhere in there is identification of the individuals. Nowhere in there uh, will you find any excoriation of somebody or any attempt to just say, well, this was a bad actor or bad actors. And, and that is very significant because blame has absolutely no place in an accident or incident investigation. And if we are going to be faithful, not, this is a sidebar for right now, but if we're going to be faithful to the idea of just culture, it can't just mean due process. It's got to mean the CINTSB method. Now, how do we take this into healthcare? Well, first of all, there is no way that we can create a National Transportation Safety Board for medicine and have them investigate every incident, every accident, every sentinel event or near miss. That's just, of course, not possible. What is possible? What is highly feasible, and I would argue is incredibly needed immediately, if not sooner, is the ability to uh, have a board, if you will, that will look into similar accidents and incidents across the country and to take certain poster accidents and incidents and situations and raise those to the level of awareness with great detail so that we can not do it again. I mean, there are many examples of this, starting back with one of the major hit lists on the Joint Commission, which was uh, a long time ago, 20 years ago, which was, if you're going to stop a heart when you didn't intend that by injecting undiluted potassium chloride, then there's a forcing function. Get rid of the undiluted stuff on the units, and it can't happen. It took a long time to make that uh, pretty much universal. But the fact is that probably we killed people for 10 years or more before anybody figured out that we needed to send out an alert. And where is the alert today? Let's go over to aviation for just a second. If something happens, and I know aviation is not the same as medicine. We're one order of magnitude at least lesser on the scale of complexity. By the same token, we deal with the same component, which is human beings. We have the ability, if something goes wrong, for instance, with a Boeing 737 this afternoon, by tomorrow morning, every operator of a Boeing 737 on the planet Earth is going to know about it, and if there's a solution, they're going to know about the solution. Now, you can argue that, well, we're dealing with human beings, human beings are dissimilar. Well, yes, we are and we aren't. But the fact is that if you've got a procedure that is dangerous to one human, it may be dangerous to a million or 10 million or 100 million or a billion. So the point is, we really do have to have an alert system, and we don't have one. Now, red cover reports, uh, basically, if they were a reality, we would probably, and of course I can only say probably, have, have different results in and several different uh, areas that I can give you as examples. The Kimberly Hyatt case up in Seattle, where I live, uh, the Sue Sheridan situation, and uh, the Julie Town situation in, in Wisconsin. Uh, it was, uh, I teased that in the earlier one, but let me, uh, let me just flip through here. First of all, here is an article, the one that uh, the Dr. Denham was referring to, an NTSP for healthcare, learning from innovation. And it does a comparison to a much uh, greater drill down extent than what I just gave you verbally. Um, the NTSB versus root cause analysis, let me cover this real quickly. The NTSB uses processes that follow the root cause analysis in some respects, but root cause analysis leads to one conclusion. As a matter of fact, I've tried to impose, and I've been banging the table on this for a long time, that we need an S after that. It needs to be root causes. But even that isn't enough because the entire methodology is unstructured, it's more apocryphal than it is a procedure. There's not a lot of rigor or discipline in it, even though I, I know a lot of you think there is. But when you take a look at the methodologies used and the rigor intellectually used uh, the NTSB, you see that there's a tremendous dissimilarity. And we would be well served by adding the level of vigor and level of, uh, of uh, discipline that, uh, that is in, in each NTSB investigation, including what we call field investigations, where the GO team doesn't go out, but one individual puts it together. Um, I, uh, I highly recommend that, uh, that you take a look at these comparisons, because at the bottom is a very important point that I mentioned. Blame is banished as a process in NTSB investigations. It is mostly inherent or can be inherent in the process, as everybody knows, in a root cause analysis. And that's why we really have got to get away from the RCA mentality as it has always been there and, and move on to something else. Now, many people have heard about Dennis Quaid's twins, uh, Dennis Quaid the actor, and about the difference between heparin and heplot, heplot being the pediatric version, heparin 1,000 times more concentrated. Uh, what happened to the twins in uh, Cedar sinai in, in uh, Los Angeles uh, back in uh, 2007, which almost killed them, but fortunately did not, was already subject to a dress rehearsal. 
Back in 2006, several infants, pardon me, were uh, were wrongly injected with heparin instead of Heplock in uh, Indianapolis. Accidentally, nobody intended to do it. And as that dress rehearsal uh, continued, several of them were lost. Now, if we had had either a red cover report situation or the capability or both to issue an alert nationwide or basically even worldwide, uh, the problem between mixing up heparin and Heplock would have been apparent to everyone. At least we would have had a higher capability and a higher probability of being able to reach those who might make the same mistake in the future. And you know, it wasn't, there are some of us who have focused in the past on the labeling difference and maybe the responsiveness or lack of responsiveness of the pharmaceutical company, but that's not the whole story. That goes back to looking at one link of the causal chain. What we had was a systemic error and a major uh, element of mutant, uh, uh, many different links in that causal chain leading to what happened in Indianapolis. And that set the stage for what happened to Dennis Quaid's twins, which fortunately didn't kill them but could have, uh, at Cedar sinai it was the same sort of mistake involving the same sort of mix-up of two medicines that are very dissimilar in terms of the concentration. Now, could I say that 100% certainty if we'd had a NTSD for medicine or a red cover reports that this would not have happened? No, we can't say that, of course, because for one thing, to get the culture to change, even when we put something like that in place, to get people to be as avaricious about looking for new reports and new alerts as we are in aviation, as we've learned to be, that takes a long time. But we've got to start someplace, and right now we don't have a system. Of course, as George Alberson once said, we don't even have a medical system in the United States. It's great people and great parts, great science, great institutions, but we've never assembled it. After the Dennis Quaid incident in 2008, it happened again in Corpus Christi. And I think I could argue that if we had the appropriate levels of warning and capability, uh, we would not see these things over and over and over again. Blue cover report on the U.S. Airways Flight 159. By the way, it's available to anybody if you want to go online. Uh, it's detailed. Everybody knows about Sully's uh, splashdown in the Hudson. I normally joke that that was the day that U.S. Airways decided to institute service between LaGuardia Airport and the Hudson, and it didn't turn out too well. Of course, in fact, what happened was uh, Sully and, uh, and his co-pilot ran into, from behind, a flock of migratory geese, and they were so concentrated in terms of the numbers that went into the engines that they essentially cored out each engine. There are only two engines on an Airbus A320, and once you've lost the second engine, you are now a glider. He had very little time to do anything other than go back into the mode of training and uh, using his intellect and that of his co-pilot and communication, they made the decision to not try to glide to Teterboro, which would have been fatal for everybody aboard, for many reasons that I can go into later. But uh, they, they made the decision to put it down in the Hudson, and they saved everybody aboard. Now, there are so many links to this causal chain that it almost boggles the mind. And you would think, well, what are the links? They ran into the birds, they didn't have any power, and they had to put it down someplace. Yes, but you see, there are things about decision making, about the value of crew resource management, about communication, about the uh, uh, the location or identification of migratory fowl, uh, not just in the vicinity of an airport. I mean, it goes on and on and on, and every one of those links in that causal chain that led to the splash down in the Hudson uh, is deserving of a lot of attention because, again, it'll show up in another accident if it hasn't already, if it's not snipped out of the entire. Uh, commercial air transportation system. So this report, when you read it, you realize that, that we don't do things like this in medicine. We don't have this dispassionate look at, at a circumstance in which, for instance, nowhere in this report will you see, well, he could have turned back to LaGuardia and probably glided back there. In other words, maybe he didn't do it right. Uh, it is a fact that that was one of the things that he could have done. There was no way that he or his co-pilot could have known that they had enough energy for, and you have to take that in context, as the report talks about, with the reality that we have long taught in commercial aviation that uh, you never turn back to an airport because it's usually a, a fatal thing to do. You don't have enough airspeed or altitude. So all the things that came together here, many, many different links in this causal chain, are well represented. Imagine if we had a typical long site surgery presented this way, with many, many cases used as examples. No names, no HIPAA violations 
but the analysis of what goes into the typical wrong side surgery or what goes into the typical failure to communicate that ends up with a mistake in the OR or the ED. I mean, we can go on to a million examples, but there are at least 25 things, if I were controlling this in the red cover reports, that I would dive into immediately to put out in terms of investigatory red cover reports to make sure that we tried not to let things happen again. Here's another one that I highly recommend you read if you want to get into this. This is many, many pages, over 200, I think. Asiana Flight 214. You probably heard me on the air talking about this at ABC. One of the things I said, by the way, sounds very simplistic. I said that uh, this was a crash that occurred because there were no pilots in the cockpit of that 777. It's interesting how many people uh, kind of did a uh, Labrador look and said, what, what, what do you mean there were no pilots? No, there were systems operators, and that wasn't a pejorative, blaming the guys who were up there in that cockpit. Their airline and their industry had failed to train them to handle the airplane under visual conditions. All they knew was automation. They were systems operators, and that is something that goes way beyond the individual performance of an individual human being. There again, if you're going to get all this richness out of there and prevent future occurrences that have anything to do with this sort of situation, you've got to look at every link in the causal chain. And in medicine, we've got links all over the place. We are absolutely awash with various, uh, various examples of things that continue to go wrong over and over and over again, and many times we don't find out uh, as a profession until way late in the game. Uh, the Sue Sheridan story, uh, this, this may not seem something that would be as... Uh, as conducive to the effects of a red cover report, but I believe they are. Uh, Sue uh, has had a, just a, a terrible circumstance of two major uh, health care events, that, uh, health care mistakes that uh, robbed her of her husband and, uh, and also basically uh, uh, left her with uh, her son Cal uh, permanently damaged, brain damaged from Trinicterus. And many of you know the story. Uh, Sue has written about it. Uh, basically, a $2 test wasn't done. Here's a, a mother who's got an MBA, a father who's got an MBA. These are both highly educated, highly trained people. They're trying to tell the hospital that the child they just brought home from the hospital is yellow and, and something's wrong and they are not, uh, they are not listened to. The very act, as a matter of fact, this is one that I repeat constantly, the very act of not listening to a worried parent and just writing it off as an overly concerned mother is a very dangerous act. If we could just expose that back, I think, through red cover reports and through alerts, we could save a lot of lives out there. Later, uh, Pat, her husband, was diagnosed too late with cancer, and it turns out that the diagnosis was actually made before when they removed the tumor the first time, but the information uh, was never provided to them, and then later it was an attempt to basically say, oh, no, we didn't see that, and it was he lost his life as a result of it. This sort of thing is very, very salutary and important in terms of telling these stories, not just for the purpose of this individual story, but for the purpose of uh, for the purpose of making sure that we don't let these things happen again. And there's a lot to be learned. Uh, Sue went on to become a leader in uh, in healthcare and is doing that today and doing great things. This is one of the papers that I highly recommend to you: Disclosure Through Our Eyes. Uh, Nurse Hyatt. Kimberly Hyatt up here in our area in Seattle. I'm still white hot angry about the way this was handled and mishandled, but basically here is a perfect example of how until we finally get to the point of being able to organize our philosophical approach to mistakes, we tend to vilify people, we tend to go for the throat of one bad actor when there really isn't a bad actor, ignoring all the systemic causation. And, uh, and in her particular case, a 20-year nurse, a nurse with 20 years almost perfect performance, makes a terrible mistake that she was set up for by circumstance, not by anybody, and ends up killing an infant by injecting the wrong thing, taking uh, something, putting it in the IV line that should have been topical. Uh, uh, this, this sort of situation had absolutely nothing to do with volition on anybody's part. It had nothing to do with misconduct on her part. And yet, not only was she abandoned by her hospital, but this typical rush to say, uh, I, I, I'm, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're all okay, but this is the bad actor, and the rest of our system is great, so we're just going to expel her and everything will be fine. And the details I'm not going to take the time to go into, but the basic idea is the philosophy. As long as we have only root cause analysis, and as long as we have a failure to understand the overall systemic analysis of each and everything that goes wrong, we're going to continue to do this sort of thing. 
And the bottom line here was that after being completely excoriated and expelled and, and even having her license restricted unnecessarily by the uh, nursing board, uh, Kimberly took her own life and hung herself. And at her funeral, there was over 170 patients' families uh, coming to honor her. And it was something that wasn't done by the folks who should have closed ranks around her. This situation has been repeated uh, with less lethal result in other situations. But what it comes down to is this. Our philosophy of saying, oh, something went wrong. Let's find out who did it. Either get rid of them, excoriate them, blame or shame them, and then go on. This is where a red cover report system, a national transportation safety board system for medicine would be so incredibly invaluable because it would help to change rapidly the philosophy by holding up for analysis in the cold light of, of truth and reason the fact that when human beings get together in a very high-risk environment, you're going to have mistakes. The most honorable element is when you recognize that and you recognize that if anybody comes in and says, we're going to teach you how to zero mistakes, they don't know what they're talking about. But if they come in and say, we're going to teach you how to minimize the opportunity for mistakes to occur, but to have a prophylaxis in place to absorb safely those mistakes that we can't prevent, that's a true system, a safety system. And that's the type of thing that's been promoted by the NTSB and aviation uh, and in the pipeline and all the things that they touch. That's what we desperately need in medicine without really any question in my mind. Uh, and John, there's John, really uh, yeah. John, I'm going to jump in here and just ask you to address the release of her HR content of her file uh, to the press because I think That's, that yep. is also a characteristic that probably contributed to her uh, vilification and shame. Uh, absolutely, Chuck, and I appreciate that. I, there's so much to this, and I try not to get on my soapbox too much, but as I say, I'm still quite hot angry about this. I probably always will be. Uh, in order to vilify her and show that the problem was not this particular hospital or anybody in it, the problem was just this one so-called bad actor, uh, someone uh, took the HR file and leaked it to the media in order to excoriate her as an individual, her lifestyle, etc. And, uh, and that led directly to a call for, uh, for restrictions on her license and led to her suicide, not only indirectly but directly. Uh, and again, I'm sure we can find a lot of other examples that have not become false celebrities around the country. Julie Tao's story is, is also, a matter of fact, is even uh, as infuriating in terms of another element, and that is a criminal involvement that has absolutely no place in medical mistake. Uh, unless somebody is, of course, doing something advertently. But if it's inadvertent, this has no place. Uh, Julie made a mistake. She was kind of set up for that mistake to a certain extent. There were court systems issues that have never really been appropriately addressed because there was no forum in which to address them. There was a closed unit. Nurses were exhausted covering for each other so they didn't have to have travelers. Fatigue was very important in this uh, story, but it wasn't talked about. The barcoding system that they had was not working right, and the bags for IV versus topical uh, were easy to mix up, and that's exactly what happened. They were similar bags. They, they looked similar. We're back to the heparin and heplock type of situation. The anesthesiologists were uh, routinely doing a workaround with the nurses where the nurses would preload the pumps, and that later on was used to excoriate her on the basis legally that she was uh, providing medication without a license, which was you know, as about as far from the truth as, as you can get. The institutionalized workaround and all these other elements were very important. And other than the fact that then a prosecutor got involved because uh, records were provided that uh, should not have been out of the, uh, uh, out of the hospital, uh, a prosecutor trying to make a name for himself or herself uh, got involved, and, uh, and we end up with something that we've seen in aviation as well. The, the taking of basically a human mistake that had no intention behind it and trying to make it into a criminal act, uh, that ha should be done with, with great care. In aviation, it retards safety because it retards communication. And guess what? It does exactly the same thing in medicine. So even though that's a bit of a sidebar, in this particular instance, the lack of ability to get this out to everybody in healthcare, all the details of what happened to this lady and, and how it should never happen to anybody again, should never have happened that way, it's much more than just a criminal prosecution for something that was done with uh, no advertency. It was far more. It was a, the fatigue factor and all the things that occurred that led to the mistake, and that was a mistake. 
Now, by the way, if there's anyone who thinks that I'm advocating that there's never any personal responsibility because everything is now systemic, please get rid of that idea. There is a point at which when the investigation is properly done and you've not talked about blame, but you now know everything that happened, you've done an NTSB style investigation, then and only then it is appropriate to turn around and say, okay, now that we know what happened, did anybody fail to rise to the level of professionalism that we expected of them? This is more information about the, uh, uh, the situation with, uh, with Julie Cow's story. Um, I think in uh, basically continuing just to, in wrapping up here, uh, what it really comes down to is the sort of accountability for systemic error and full transparency that we saw uh, reflected in the Braxton Rell story. And just in a capsule, Braxton was a young boy who, uh, who said the night before he went in for a toxic tonsillectomy to his father, Dad, I'm scared. And his father, with great faith in the medical system, said, uh, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. Well, 24 hours later, the son was dead. He bled out after a tonsillectomy. And the fact was that no one would tell him what happened. No one would tell the father why his son was dead. And it took legal procedures to do that. And in the process, there were so many things that were done that really need to be exposed because what it came down to was this defensiveness, hiding facts that we all need to know, hiding the clinical realities, and doing so for all the wrong reasons. Whether or not the reasons were similar or, or, or seemed to be valid to the people who made the decisions they made in the hospital not to disclose, the reality is that we all need to know when something goes wrong. We need to know how to make it not happen again. And that is the sort of thing that this red cover report and NTSB style of investigation would, uh, would take care of. So I, I'm sorry to pound the pulpit so badly, but uh, I am just absolutely uh, immovable on the attitude that we need this yesterday. And the question is, who's going to do it? How do we put it together? Can we make it a public-private partnership? Can we make it effective? And can we do it as rapidly as possible? Because we've got probably 25 years of vital information, and nobody's seen a bit of it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. And during our reactor period, we'll come back to the side-by-side -side comparison between the NTSB and the Red Cover Report and this issue of being able to really look at the multiple causal systems and the contributing elements to that uh, are ideal for our dialogue with the top uh, Peabody here uh, a little bit later at our reactor panel about the community of practice that we build because uh, there's so much learning that we can get from the accidents that occur and get out of theoretical and say, look, here's a really common accident that occurs over and over again in health information technology. How could we take the red cover report prospectively and and when we are learning about these, uh, it, you know, it has direct applications. So I think you're, you're setting us up for a topical area on the community of practice. Let me uh, just move quickly now so that we can have a good dialogue regarding uh, where, where we're heading. Uh, I'm going to go through a number of frameworks and some wonderful resources that are available to us in health information technology and EHR patient safety. I just want to draw your attention back to the slides that we opened with to say these are in the top ten and uh, there's enormous overlap and that we're brought our, our community of practice that we'll tackle and for those of you that have not been attending every month, uh, an enormous uh, number of our attendees said, I want to be in a community of practice on health information technology. And we sometimes we use the term uh, EHR in, in place of health information technology, but what will be led uh, as we are led by uh, Dr. Peabody through this process, it is the broader circle of health information technology, technologies that manage information. And in so doing, the alarm hazards and a number of the other issues are really important. I want to draw your attention back to what I used to develop uh, a little bit of a background for John. This uh, recommendation for the NTSB approach was part of the 2012 report and the framework that was provided in the report, the socio-technical model, but then also the framework you see on the slide here below in, uh, on slide 50 addresses reporting, collecting, aggregating, analyzing, investigating, and disclosing, and using that for performance improvement. And again, here's a little bit different 
lar enlargement of the socio-technical model. Now, why am I showing you this? Well, this was in the IOM report, the most unbiased body of scientists that advise Congress and uh, are probably the least conflicted. And conflict of interest has been a big issue for us over the last couple of years. And um, so it really, really was well prepared. Now, uh, 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 Dr. Hardy Shing, uh, Singh and, and, uh, 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 and th their group have proposed an eight-dimensional socio-technical model of safe and effective healthcare IT use. And I'm showing you these frameworks because this is what we're going to tackle with the community of practice. We're not just going to be howling at the moon, here's a problem, what do we do, woe is me, wring our hands. No, what are the frameworks that we can use? What are the resources that a community that are practicing and learning about where the risks are what are the frameworks, what are the lenses, as, uh, as Clayton Christensen would say, uh, should we use to be able to look through to be able to identify what to do? So when we do so, diagnost errors in diagnosis revolve around accurate information. As a radiation oncologist, I can tell you, cross-trained radiology, that uh, I love to see the framework that came out last month in the IOM report. So I've just shown you three frameworks. I've shown you the social, four frameworks, actually, the reporting framework that complements what John has been saying, the five-element socio-technical model of the IOM report, and the eight element model that, that Dr. Singh and his group have proposed and actually have articulated in articles I'm going to show here in a few minutes. My purpose for showing them to you is not for you to learn them today, but understand that in the community of practice, we are going to apply these frameworks so you have a working model to use in your organization to go back to at, that is well grounded in the literature. So. This model that you see before you, the IOM model, I think is terrific. It, it, it shows with the cycle that you see uh, around the diagnostic process that it's an iterative and a continually rolling process for patients and that we have to really be able to manage this information for accurate, accurate and timely diagnosis and diagnostic errors and misses and to be able to catch them. So, uh, what I'm showing you now is a terrific resource, and we've had wonderful speakers from the Office of the National Coordinator of uh, Health Information Technology, Dr. David Hunt, one of our favorite leaders in patient safety, who's, who's their former leaders of uh, ONC, and a lot of the information that has been provided uh, to, uh, to us uh, has been organized by this terrific uh, uh, element of uh, HHS. So I draw your attention to go back, take a look at their website. It's one of the better websites, probably the best government website that I've seen. This is their landing page. It allows you to navigate it very quickly, and uh, you'll see in a moment uh, the content that, that, that uh, is there. As we undertake our community of practice for health information technology, don't wait till then. Go on this website and take a look at some of the assets. They're terrific. This Safer Guide. The, these are the, the Safer Guides program are actually checklists that are wonderfully prepared to help you identify and focus on electronic healthcare uh, record issues and uh, and errors. So I actually dropped in one of the checklists to show you uh, the kind of content that we'll go through. And what, what we're going to do in the community of practice is help all of us go through this content and sort out where would we apply it. But in this particular checklist, uh, you know, it addresses hardware, it addresses uh, uh, electric generators, it, direct, it, it addresses the paper forms, it addresses um, what the recommended practices are. It's evidence-based, it was funded by ARC, they're free, and you can download them. So I would, I would go ahead on the ARC website, just type in S-A-F-E-R uh, uh, in the search function and you'll find them. But there are a lot of other assets that are really important to us as we go forward. Uh, the Connecting Healthcare and Care for the Nation uh, Interoperability Roadmap that they have, the Health Information Technology Patient Safety Action and Surveillance Plan, and a, a number of other models that you can actually use. And I think they've just done a terrific job of putting together a lot of assets. Perfect? No. But are there opportunities there to really uh, take advantage of, the, of this? Absolutely. And just so you know, that some of the slides uh, are present, uh, you'll see, have Times Roman, Times Roman 
font, and I noticed the timeline with the Dennis Quaid slide uh, was a little, the formatting was a little different. I think that's a, a, a PC to Mac uh, conversion issue. But I, I went and looked at the PDF while John was speaking, and the PDF is has the proper uh, font. So uh, don't no worries if you see things are a little out, and you'll see that this has uh, uh, got Times Roman. But the Health IT Safety Center Roadmap is worth skimming through and taking a look at. If you look at these frameworks and context of what's being laid out, we're really in the infancy of this, and, and I think leaders like John Nance and like Toff Peabody, Dr. Peabody, um, are championing the cause for helping us apply these frameworks to this new area with these old problems that we're having. They're systems issues. And that kind of foreshadows this piece. This is a, an e-book uh, that was funded by Ankh. You can go on their website and you can look at the link at the bottom of the page. Terrific book on better EHR. It's an exhaustive review. It's a large file. You can download it entirely free. Your taxes paid for it. But I particularly liked this framework. Again, I'm just introducing you to some frameworks that we're going to dig into deeply, more deeply with our community of practice. But this addresses information that's in the system, but nobody maybe really wants it. What's in the system wanted by users, but not used in our care activities or the activities we undertake. Users, uh, there are certain things they really want to have, that, they're, that they can't have, and that's the light blue part of the Venn diagram here. And then uh, if you walk around the clock there, you can see that uh, what we really need to do is identify what we really need and be really good at that and maybe not necessarily wor worry about having a smart clipboard or a smart file drawer. And I think uh, Toff uh, Peabody in our, uh, in our interactive uh, session is going to address that with emergency medicine. So moving quickly, uh, the framework that you saw that Dr. Singh had put together, which and you'll see the reference in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine article, that framework of the eight-element model was used by the Joint Commission to address 120 events. So I really recommend Sentinel event number 54. We're going to cover it in our in our in our in our collaboration uh, with our. Uh, uh, community of practice, uh, but it really does lay out some of these really critical systems issues, and it builds on uh, the Sentinel event number 42, and we just included that for completeness, so you can see that 54 builds on 42, and it's a great place for you as your safety and quality team uh, kind of gear up on this to go through these, because it shows you how to apply the lens of the framework to some real issues that are practical, that are frequent, that are severe, that are measurable, and preventable. So uh, a recent webinar, uh, a modern healthcare, it was a, uh, it, it, you had to pay to attend, and I paid to attend and really learned a lot from it, um, uh, was uh, hosted by Modern Healthcare, and it was excellent. And Dr. Singh was one of the speakers as well as the, the medical leader uh, of, the, uh, of the Office of the National Coordinator, did a great job. This is a great reference, a New England Journal of Medicine article, and as we know, as we work with our teams and we start to get challenged on new things we're doing, we, all sh we always should go back to the references. There's no better reference than the New England Journal, as you all know. Any of us that have, um, uh, have been editors of journals or have submitted articles to the New England Journal, the rigor that they put these articles through. And um, Dr. Singh addresses these three spheres of safe IT, HIT, safe use of HIT, and then using HIT to improve safety. You don't automatically get all those things. First, it's got to operate well. You've got to know how to operate it well. And then how can we use it to improve care? This is kind of a funny citation that he gave in that, in that session where smokers who were get, to, to be given an anti-smoking medication uh, uh, help uh, to, to prevent smoking got Viagra. And you can imagine the number of jokes that, uh, uh, that came from it. But it was an example of uh, a systematic error that was replicated over many patients. Another one, and, and Toph will ask you to kind of address this, especially in the emergency department, but using the electronic healthcare record, uh, the articles are coming out that are showing us that, that because we have many alerts, because we have many responses, because of the man-machine interface, and I'm going to ask Frank Guillotto as a biomedical engineer to kind of address this, uh, there's a lot we can learn on the performance interface between devices and and the, the information management and the real work. And this is where Julie Tao, 
those four systems issues. She was fatigued because she'd done double shifts. They had a closed department where they had no traveling nurses, look-alike bags, a barcode system that was not working, and a formalized checklist workaround that had the nurses load the pumps before the anesthesiologist came to do the epidural set her up. There, I, I can tell you, as I have studied it, and, and she was our fellow, and we gave her employment when nobody would so that we could help tell her story. Uh, uh, it, I, all I could say was, as I saw what happened with Julie, I would have done exactly what Julie did, and I would have killed uh, that, uh, that new mom. Uh, no question. And it haunts us to think that this can keep happening without the red cover report to help us understand the system's failures. Here's an app, uh, the slide in radiology about validation of the healthcare record and how using triggers to identify. Here's like phase three of what Dr. Singh addresses. You know, first it's got to be a safe system without, without errors that it's already got embedded in it. Then we've got to use it safely. But then once we get those two done, we could use it to improve safety in a, and use it for good clinical decision support. Here's an article about identifying abnormal lung imaging findings. And, and I subspecialized in lung, breast, uh, colon, and prostate cancer. And I can tell you, catching a lung cancer early and having a cure is one of the greatest things in your career as an oncologist uh, because it's hard to do. And the thought that we could, we could use IT to automatically do it is so exciting. And we'll ask Toff uh, Peabody, Dr. Peabody, to address this issue of emergency physician task switching with the introduction of an EHR. As we introduce it, we've introduced new factors. And John, you might address this as well. When we start to fly a new jet, a new airplane that has new systems, uh, we make a lot of mistakes when we're learning, kind of getting our pattern down. Another article in JAMIA regarding an analysis of EHR record-related patient safety concerns. These are the buckets. Again, we don't expect, I don't expect you to know anything other than we're going to address these in the community of practice. Another article on electronic health record safety concerns, cross-sectional survey. So there's a lot that's been written about it. Um, Record-based triggers to detect potential delays in cancer diagnosis uh, in the BMJ. So there's an awful lot of really good content uh, in the system. Now, I'm right on time. I wanted to leave us a generous time for uh, discussion. But I wanted to come back to um, Ankh. And I, I can't say enough about what a great job that they are trying to do in a very difficult area. Uh, how many government agencies put out a publicity release to say that we've got a complaint survey and we'd like you to respond and give you the opportunity to respond anonymously. We've had a number of you want to respond to this, uh, the, the influence that appears to have uh, happened that, that uh, kept us from getting the risk areas of EHR as a list so that we can understand where these accidents occur. And John, you and I, you know, flying jets and, and me and the airplane manufacturing end of things, uh, uh, for us to not have a category to report an accident and a finding is unconscionable. And yet, uh, somehow this happened. And this is one of those opportunities where uh, the, the, when we want to uh, submit things that could be better, here Ankh is asking for that with this form. So we wanted to put that up for you so that you saw that, uh, saw that, that that's real leadership. And I, and I think it's terrific. I'm going to close here with uh, the polling question so then we can come back to, to uh, Top Peabody first. Uh, and Frank Guillotto second, Jenny Dingman as a uh, reactor now, and then back to John. But the polling questions are, I would like to be involved in providing feedback to HIT safety organizations to improve safety. And we just showed you the forum of a great, of, you know, there's great leadership in government. They really want, and those two don't collide in the same sentence in most people's vocabulary, and yet they're asking for input. And, uh, you know, if you want to be involved in uh, making solid contributions to what could be done in, this, in the health information technology space, it might not even be EHRs. It might be bike barcode. It might be using text after ED visits, uh, whatever. Uh, uh, if you'd like to be involved and be notified as to opportunities to be able to have some influence, and that's what's great about our country, that's the qu first question. Second question, I believe we should uh, include patient advocates and consumers as participants in our health information technology community of practice. I'm telling you, I believe we should. We will. We would like to be able to go back to our audience and say that you all believe that as well, that we need to have patients and families, fully vested members in the community to provide information to us, especially because of the ambulatory care environment and how they play a major role. 
The third is just a housekeeping question. Do you want to start in December? Would you like the three webinar series we committed to to start in December, or would you like a fresh start in January? Is it so critical you want to do it in December, or is it better to start in January just because of attendance and for whatever reason? And then the final question is, do you want this community of practice to be part of our normal cycle of webinars, or would you like it to be an extra one and have us rotate back through healthcare, and, uh, healthcare uh, associated infections and medication errors and diagnostic errors and do this in parallel? It helps us because we're allocating resources uh, to this. So those are our questions, and I'd like to at this time uh, I have as many of you as possible answer those questions. And then as you're listening, also, we'd like to know what are the topics that you'd like to hear about. We think we've got a pretty good review, but you all always come up with terrific ideas uh, to help on health information technology, including but not limited to EHR. Could be barcode, could be using text, could be uh, uh, HIPAA issues regarding information. Uh, we want to hear from you to know what do you want, and we will guarantee that every one that you submit will address one way or the other in the webinar. And then the final one is you probably heard some pretty good speakers in HIT. Would you list for us who you'd like to have us reach out to to be speakers, and we'll get them for you if we can. And most people, uh, you know, we've never, we haven't been turned down in more than a decade or 15 years. I don't think we've ever been turned down for a speaker other than conflict. So we're really blessed to have them really want to reach out to you. So what I'd like to do is stop now and uh, turn things over to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Christopher Peabody, who goes by TOF. Uh, he has uh, been working with us for more than seven years. Uh, he joined uh, 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 us uh, when he was a medical student, and I met him at Harvard. I gave a talk at the, uh, uh, in, uh, at the Kennedy School on patient safety and leadership. He came up and he said, I really want to be involved. And you know, you hear many people say that, but this is someone that just when he says he's going to do it, he does, and we've worked together since. He helped us with uh, getting more than 92 medical students to, uh, or tried to get them to the Nice meeting, the global safety meeting in, uh, in Nice years ago. He has uh, finished uh, one of the toughest and best residencies in emergency medicine uh, here in California, uh, the, the USC LA program, and is now uh, going to be teaching and practicing uh, in the Bay Area at, the, at uh, UCSF and uh, is also will also be a speaker in, in Fort Worth. And he has a special expertise in health information technology and emergency medicine, more broadly HIT, but as an expert in emergency medicine, really applying this to this really critical area. So, Toph, do you want to lead off with uh, reactions and comments and thoughts? Yeah, Chuck, thank you so much for the uh, wonderful introduction. And I just want to... Uh, reiterate what John Nance uh, was talking about with his red cover reports. I can't uh, emphasize enough what an excellent idea this is. Um, we know, as you've pointed out, we have a lot of information now about uh, patient safety, even quality improvement in the um, HIT space. Uh, there's many articles that you had pointed out, and there's government organizations that have checklists that we can actually use. So these are sometimes siloed information, and I'm really excited about this new community of practice. Now, for me, especially in the emergency department, this is the highest risk clinical environment um, potentially in the entire uh, medical, medical community. <clears throat> um, we need the right information at the right time to make the right decision. And that's no different than any other clinicians out there but in the emergency department, that needs to be done very quickly and efficiently. And so I'd just like to take a little bit of time um, right now and just talk about some of the difficulties, especially in the emergency department, on our workflow solutions related to HIT. Um, we had mentioned that there's a, uh, uh, you had mentioned, Chuck, a few articles that talked about uh, uh, task switching and when we switch over to electronic medical records how emergency physicians are interrupted more, how they're doing more tasks in shorter amounts of time, and this leads to, uh, to medical errors. But I'd also like everyone to just think about um, medicine in general, and especially the emergency department, as a place for handoffs and transitions. And as we all know, this is a, a great uh, uh, opportunity for error. But in the emergency department, it's happening very quickly. Um, and so, like, for example, we, we send people home all the time. We send them over to radiology to get radiology studies. 
We send them, um, we, we get um, patients from skilled nursing facilities, and then we send patients into the hospital. We send them in the inpatient units to the ICU, or even directly to the OR, to the cath lab. I mean, this is an extreme place of transition. It's very high-risk care, and it needs, to, again, to be done quickly and efficiently. I just want to talk about one particular type of transition that we're seeing more and more, <clears throat> especially now that our uh, population is changing. And this is the transition from the skilled nursing, nursing facility to the emergency department, and even back from the emergency department to the skilled nursing facility. And I want to illustrate this with the case that I saw two weeks ago. And this was in the San Francisco General Emergency Department, um, which UCSF runs, and I'm a assistant professor there now. Um, this was a hard case because I had seen this patient a couple of weeks prior, and she actually was doing quite well, and I was actually quite happy that she had gotten placed in a SNF because I thought she'd do well with her rehabilitation. Unfortunately, in the middle of the night at 2 a.m., she came into the emergency department, brought in by AIM. Um, she was not doing well. She uh, needed to be intubated um, because she was rapidly deteriorating from a respiratory standpoint. Um, but EMS had brought in a DNR, DNI, a pulse form, which we all know that there's a bunch of best practices out there on how to fill those out and go over it with family members and patients. Um, it turns out that the uh, son actually had a, uh, a discussion with the primary care provider. Um, which was great um, about uh, their the DNR and DNI status, so they do not resuscitate and do not intubate status of this patient two weeks prior, right when she was admitted the last time to the hospital. Now, they uh, elected to have her um, do not intubate and do not resuscitate. However, when she got transitioned over to the uh, skilled nursing facility, their default when they can't get a hold of anyone and that and where records aren't transferred electronically. So I'm now talking about this era of interoperability that we all know about, but it is not really being practiced right now. Um, the default at the SNF care is to place on full code. So meaning that when she came into the emergency department the second time, the paramedic handed me the pulse form filled out by the skilled nursing facility that said she was a full code, and the patient did get intubated, um, did have a central line placed was a full court press, and while my resident was simultaneously contacting the son at 2 in the morning, finally got a hold of him after um, all that had been done. He arrived and was horrified that his mother had something that she didn't want to do. Now, this is a medical error that's, uh, that is, is common. Um, it's one that uh, we have best practices about. Um, it's one that if we had red cover reports, um, that I think uh, would be, would definitely be decreased. And so we know things like juxtaposition errors, poor data quality display, alert fatigue, interoperability. We know all these things need to be implemented into our EMR and our, our um, health IT, but uh, it's not being done. And so I really think that this is, uh, this is an excellent opportunity for us to introduce and implement the things that we already know about use these safer self-assessment uh, guides, and uh, start our community of practice so that things like this don't happen again. It's like many of the examples that John Nance gave. You know, I, I would, I'm, uh, this is a case that I was involved in. Um, this is a case that, uh, that many of us have, uh, know, and it's a case that's going to continue to happen as our population ages and our patients aren't able to advocate for themselves, especially in this case, with this patient was uh, was um, had some dementia at baseline, so her communication ability was difficult. So we're we're we have this community. We're starting this community of practice. I'm really excited about it. I think we're going to have a lot of impact, um, and I'd be happy to talk more about anything else, Chuck, uh, regarding to the emergency department, um, HIT, and EMR. Great. Well, we'll come back to you. Uh, uh, the, the issue of uh, which you and I've talked about extensively is that transition out of the ED and, and, and being able to provide the patient, family, and other caregivers with what to do if something happens is so critical. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think that there's an enormous opportunity here to take the continuum of care through the lens of 
uh, some of the services like uh, emergency department, uh, uh, the trip to surgery, trip to ICU, and we've got great experts on that. Let me shift gears for a moment. The, uh, we'll go to Frank, and then we'll go to Jenny, and then we'll go back to John on his comments. Frank is a biomedical engineer, kind of uh, very aware of the man-machine interface issues and performance uh, uh, improvement, and is one of our leaders who uh, helped identify a lot of these categories of, of uh, problems. What uh, Anything that you want to share with this audience today, knowing that you'll get to participate later with the community of practice? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, Chuck, I, I think I, I must commend um, John and, and you, because I know you were part of the catalyst in, uh, in proposing this uh, red cover report. And, you know, from an engineering standpoint, I mean, I know that we don't like to uh, overly focus on the aspects of production and healthcare, but, you know, we are no different than many of the, the high performance uh, production environments. And um, every uh, one of those environments do look at systems issue and the socio-technical aspect of how a system is going to behave when you bring in a new technologies. And uh, specifically, and address this in a prospective way using uh, things such as the failure modes and effects analysis. So rather than just looking at the root cause when a failure happens, uh, we prospectively design a lot of these elements into uh, the workflows into the, uh, the, the, the technologies so as to avoid uh, these things from happening. Now, that's in a, an ideal situation when you're starting from the ground up, which is why a red cover report type approach is uh, extremely valuable uh, because we can't afford to wait and have a perfect environment. We have to learn from the prior uh, mistakes that have been made and and then subsequently try to design that into uh, our uh, our systems to make them more resilient and you know right now if we look at healthcare we we're very good about pointing out when the problem has occurred we have uh, high alert medication you know ISMP does provide regular updates but don't necessarily provide the information that's necessary to apply that into your environment so, you know, I strongly believe that red uh, cover report is going to have huge value. The, the other component I think we need to, to keep uh, in mind, and I think that couples back to the cyber the crime and cybersecurity, uh, as we make the information uh, more readily available, we're exposing ourselves increasingly to risk of having misinformation. And I think uh, Toph's comment about uh, the information being available readily um, points to the fact that, you know, we did enter it in the system, but was the, the information accurate? And think about a, a cybercrime situation where somebody does contaminate uh, the, um, the record and you end up with an incorrect information such as uh, blood type or other while in an emergent situation where you don't really have the time to cross-check. So, we're going to have to be increasingly sensitive about those elements, and I think we have to be increasingly sensitive whenever we're bringing a new piece of technology into our environment. Uh, with the Internet of Things and every device now having an IP address, you can imagine the headaches of potential hacking and people getting through the back door of a, of a network and changing or collecting information that ultimately can impact patient safety. So all these are, are really issues that we're going to be facing. I mean, the interoperability is a wonderful thing. We want that information to be readily available immediately. But I think we're going to be doing through the same phases as we did with online banking and the concerns of you know, do we really want to be using that ATM or are people going to be accessing my information inappropriately? And uh, I think elements such as uh, the red cover report will help us mitigate those risks as we move forward, as we learn from our mistakes. John. Thank you. Thank you. Really wonderful comments, Frank. And <clears throat> I put the eight elements, uh, socio-technical model of uh, SING uh, uh, up uh, because I think you addressed a number of them. And as we go into the community of practice, um, these are really going to help us identify that. And I'm so glad you brought up the finance issue because we all trust our ATM, 
and yet uh, there was a lot of learning that had to go on there. Uh, Jenny, uh, uh, I, we're, we are definitely going to include patients and families as fully vested members in our community, and I ask the question because I believe our audience believes that should, is the case as well, but why don't you take that on um, uh, in addition to um, uh, addressing the fact that you know we have only we have over 90 million home family caregivers in America today. 37 percent of our population are caring for someone else with an active medical problem, and they've got smartphones. Why aren't we looking at the entire continuum? And I think we should. And there are lots of errors and harm that can happen when they leave TOPS care and come back home. So. Could you address the two issues, Jenny, of number one, including patients and families, and number two, you know, when we go home, why we need to address this whole continuum? Thank you, Dr. Dent. I totally agree um, that we definitely need patients and families to be engaged with regard to all of the IT information, just like credit card. I myself am uncomfortable to this day with a lot of the online banking, and I always go I always go through all of my accounts to make sure that everything's okay and there's no breach of security. I look at my credit card statements. I think we need to do the same thing with regard to health information now that it's electronic. We have to teach patients and families all over this nation to look at their medical information and make sure that it's correct, to make sure that there is nothing going on. I've heard of uh, medical identities being stolen, people actually using other people's insurance, these terrible horror stories. So I think it's very important for all of our people on this webinar today to take back the thought of maybe putting together some type of public education for your hospital to educate your community on the medical records and how to identify your IT and, and access it and teach them how to do it. Because it is kind of difficult and, 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 you know, cumbersome. Once you learn how to do it, it'll be just like looking at your credit cards and your bank accounts, and I think it's really, really important to do that. Uh, secondly, the transition. You know, we have made so many great strides in patient safety in the past 10 years. But unfortunately, handoffs, transitions, we still have a big problem. And again, we have this resource out there, patients and families. We have the caregivers, as Dr. Denham just said. All over this country, I believe 90,000 or so, engage these people, use them as a resource, make sure that they do their part of the teamwork with regard to transitions and care. So we don't have horror stories like the poor lady who was interested who didn't want to be. We need their families to be engaged. We need to get a hold of the next of kin and, and make sure that whatever the wishes are, that it's, it's put forth to the hospital if someone is rushed to the hospital, even if the patient's family lives out of town. Make a way to get a hold of those people. I've heard story after story where people got the care they didn't want or and other people got wanted care and didn't get it. And, and a patient's family member or an advocate can always be the buffer to stop these things from happening. So I just, again, thank you all for being here. And I hope that you look at the patients and the family members and the advocates, caregivers, as someone very, very important in the team of health care and delivery. And I think we can make jobs easier for people who work on the inside of health care when we start using these people. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Denham. Thank you, Jenny. Absolutely. As someone who has a, a mom who's 94 who's made two trips to the emergency department from the rest home where she lives, when we, she, all she wants is supportive care, and my wife and I have to go to the emergency department and be there with her and hold her hand, and, and she goes through getting CAT scans and, and um, EKGs and all, all the rest when those directions are there. It, it, this is an increasing, you know, unless you have an, uh, don't have an older parent, you don't know that, 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 that there is a role to play and these transitions are critical. John, uh, uh, now that you've heard the reactors and any other additional thoughts you want to add, and, and one of the, I think the words of warning was our conversation we had, you know, over the Asi Asiana flight of, the, of there, weren't, there weren't pilots in that cockpit. They got so obsessed with the computers and the auto throttles and the data 
that they didn't look out the window and land the plane like you'd land a Cessna 152. You want to maybe yeah. comment on what we said, but then come back to that as kind of also a, a key issue. Well, there, there's just so many things, uh, Chuck, and I guess uh, the, the most important is that we've got to keep a macro and a micro view at the same time. Too often when uh, we've had uh, proposals ever since the IOM report in 1999, uh, folks have gotten very enthusiastic about it and then have drilled down to the point that we, don't, we lose track of the overall vision. Uh, the house is on fire, there's no question. We uh, uh, all know of the 440,000 deaths a year that Dr. John James uh, chronicled uh, two years ago. Uh, we, we certainly have a, a society that isn't yet completely aware of that, and when they do become that, there's going to be a lot of pressure. But I think in trying to uh, take what has been discussed today and, uh, and do something with it, that's the key point. What do we do with it? How fast can we act on it? Because people are dying as we're sitting here talking about it. That's not a pejorative in saying we're wasting our time or we're dragging our feet, rather. But uh, the fact is that I think each and every one of us has got to be very cognizant of the fact that all of this stuff, uh, all the things we've talked about, the cybersecurity, the, uh, certainly the, the need for the type of philosophy in the Red Cover Reports uh, and the NTSB philosophy to be infused and change the landscape of the way every single institution in healthcare operates, uh, it's, it's way overdue. So a call to action basically is also a call to individual responsibility for saying, okay, how do we do this? How can we put these ideas together? Uh, I think in addition to that, the, uh, uh, the main problem too is that we, uh, and I mentioned this in, in kind of a sidewise uh, uh, reference, but I'm very passionate about the fact that and it's almost been to me a revelation and looking around and saying, well, wait a minute, where is the source? Of best practices. I've, I've long said that there's a change in the, the covenant between a physician, uh, or for that matter anybody in healthcare, and the, uh, and the patient. That covenant used to be, I, I promise to do my best. Now it has to be, I promise to give you the best medical science can provide. That's not a solo sport. That's where we get into teamwork and all this. But we need a source of best practices. We don't have it. And, and we need to consider how should we put that together? Chad, because we can't do it with journals. We really have to discern, and a group of very highly trained people, uh, highly respected individuals uh, coming together could look around the entire planet and probably discern 45 to 55% of the things that we're doing on a regular basis have a best practice, even though it may change the scientific investigation. It is absurd in the extreme that we're only at about 18%. We've got to do something about that yesterday. And thank you, and, and thank you for drawing the attention back to best practice. And that's I, I was really excited to look at and drill down. I want to draw, draw the attention of the audience as we uh, wrap the fun, last final five, five minutes is to go look at these safer checklists. And are they perfect? No. Are we going to really take a hard look at them in the community of practice? Yes. Can we make a contribution to Ankh and will they listen? I believe so. I mean, I. I, I really believe that this is one of the organizations, especially knowing David Hunt and a lot of the folks that have been involved there, have really listened and authentically very bright people who do want to make a difference. And so as we look at these practices, and Top, uh, I'll come back to you again, as we look at these state practices, we do have a starting point. We've got some frameworks. We have a starting point and something really practical. The other thing, John, that I want to do is compliment you for being tireless in your championship of the Red Cover Report, we are going to build this approach into the community of practice so that although there may not be an NTSB for healthcare yet, and we hope there will be, we can reference that the HIT IOM group said there should be. Your Red Cover Report gives us a mechanism, and now we could really explore how we could look at accidents, because there's so many of them, in HIT, and Toph, we can apply those principles today without having an NTSB in healthcare. Maybe we can develop some evidence that would say that that really needs to be there. We're going to try to see if we can find folks that would be willing to fund prototypical red cover reports, and they may be on aggregates. And I'll come back to you, Toph, as our other clinician on this panel. If we were to put together emergency medicine HIT accidents, maybe a composite of two or three two or three real accidents that are maybe a composite or a variation so that they are not specifically one that everyone knows about, but really illustrate the problems. And we were to take, and we have John lead us 
to a red cover report on ED HIT accidents, would that be valuable to emergency physicians? And I'll turn it over to you. Chuck, I think that something like that would be invaluable to us. I mean, um, you know, just I, I, like most clinicians, kind of remember, um, you know, incidents in my career like the one I just shared. But uh, how about if that would have happened, you know, um, we would have already gone over that in a red cover report in my institution and the institution that we, uh, you know, take these transfers from. Um, they, uh, you know, already had something like this, that we already had a system in place to prevent that error, that we had uh, interoperability between the systems of our, of our hospital and the community around us, um, at least in some way, to get basic information, especially like, you know, critical information like, uh, like the one that I had mentioned in the example. Um, I think I think that's a, a great first step, and I think if we show that that's successful um, and get the data behind it, um, which there's so many tools to do that with now, um, I think it would be very successful and we could uh, have some great impact. Well, you know, when I think about the coffee room, the break room where you take a break from your ED uh, uh, work and the OR lounge that I spent many years waiting to go and do implants and working with the surgeons, it's not unlike, John, the FBO coffee room before or after a flight where you've often said, John, a blue cover report, when it hits the coffee table, everybody seizes it because we don't want to have that happen to us. Mm -hmm. I, can't, yeah. I can't imagine that it won't be the same way mm -hmm. if we had a magic wand and had the red cover report available to us. But it, at any rate, we're out of time. I want to give Frank an opportunity to add one more comment, so we just go around the, our group, and then Je I'll have Jenny close us. And it, as always, Jenny, the voice of the patient is always so valuable. Our group that works every other week with you being one of the leaders is uh, has been invaluable. And Jenny is one of the speakers, actually, at the Fort Worth meeting that I described earlier. So I'll have Frank make a comment. And then, uh, and then Jenny, uh, if you close us, and I'm going to put the Fort Worth meeting uh, <clears throat> back up, uh, the slide back up for you. Go ahead. Well, Chuck, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, looking at, at it on an optimistic <gasps> view, I think we have a unique opportunity for sure, and we can leverage the red cover. But we've been there before. Other industries have too. Um, and when I say we've been there before, we, we've, we've done some work in simulation and creating a CPOE simulator that tested those platforms that gave us some feedback that we can then bring back and improve. Couple that with a red cover report, you'll be adding simulation opportunities that some, some organizations can take immediately and apply to their environment. So I, I think, you know, the, the technology is the challenge, but I think it's also the opportunity and uh, we'll all benefit from it. Great, great comment. So <clears throat> all, of the, all of the folks on this panel and the speakers are speakers at the Fort Worth meeting. They've uh, invited uh, a number of leaders, and so I put, it, I put this back up for those of you that uh, want to participate Friday the 6th and the 7th. And Jenny uh, is one of the, in, on one of the reactor panels representing patients and families. And so I'd like to just thank John Nance again for his tireless focus on this. Um, and, and really bringing the red cover report to health information technologies. I'd like to thank Toff for uh, leading and co-leading this community of practice and Frank for his ever vigilant focus on helping us with uh, engineering and uh, for Jenny uh, who is one of the biggest uh, cheerleaders of all of us to do a better job. Jenny, you want to close us and God bless all of you and we'll uh, see you next month. Go ahead, Jenny. Oh. Yeah, what a great webinar. And John, you are one of my heroes forever. Thank you for your tireless work in air safety, patient safety. Um, Dr. Denham, you're, of course, you're one of my heroes as well. And um, these webinars are so wonderful that you're, you're giving to folks to participate in, to save lives and make patients and safer in this country. I just want to close with, Please use your patients and families and advocates. It will make your jobs easier and make your life easier. Um, have a wonderful day, and thank you so much, and God bless. And I'll turn it back over to you, Doctor. Thank you, and that ends our webinar. Take care. God bless. We'll, we'll work on our, from our polling information to pick the topics for November and December. So your input, we'll, we're listening to, and we're going to uh, uh, use the topics accordingly. Have left the meeting.